March 1969, Ron and Reg Cray were found guilty of murder at the Old Bailey. Mr Justice Melford Stevenson, sentencing them to life imprisonment, told them, I'm not going to waste words on you. In my view, society has earned a rest from your activities, and I recommend that you be held for at least 30 years. When the van pulled up to the Bailey and took them away, that's when the big time started for the twins. The real big time, big bucks. Not the penny ante stuff that went on before. The whole gangster syndrome started for them in 1969. That's when they started making big, big dough. Locked behind bars, many believed the craze world of violence and menace had come to an end. Nothing could have been further from the truth. For the next 30 years from their prison cells, Ron and Reg Cray ran a multi-million pound empire, financing a life of luxury and favour behind bars. The Crays made more money inside prison than they did outside. I know they still continue to run um, an empire, both of them from inside prison. Um, they'd open clubs, uh, they tell people by letter or by phone to go to those clubs. There was money exchanging hands to open clubs, to take over pubs, betting offices, record shops, um, snooker halls. The things really that they did whilst they were out. But just how big were the craze before they were jailed? In the underworld, so-called, they were very much halfway down the pecking order. They were not East End gangsters, they were Bethnal Green gangsters, very, very local. They could never move outside that area without being told where to go if they tried to flex their muscles outside their own little patch. On their own little patch, of course, they were pretty formidable. The cries were very big fish in a very small pond. There were other gangs in London when they were at their reign, just as big, some bigger and more clever than what they were. It was a lot easier to run Bethnal Green 35 years ago and there was only 15,000 people in Bethnal Green. Now there's 255,000 people and half of them don't even speak English and they wouldn't listen to the two tasty geezers who owned the snook wall down the road, whoever they were. The cry started off as uh, local thugs, hooligans, protection money, etc. They used the talents they had in violence. They could both be very, very violent, yeah. Ronnie was the more violent one, but Reggie was the worst one to upset. If Ron never had his medication, as he told me, he said, I, I, I would go mad, he said, you know, they're the only thing that really stopped me from going insane. He used to rant and lose his temper and his face he used to really distort. But Reggie was very calm, he'd done things very coldly, you know. If he was going to stab you, he'd just stab you. I think where Ronnie would have killed in anger, Reggie would have killed in hate. I can remember someone coming into the, the club and uh, Reggie Cray shoving the comb through their cheeks. Reggie had a long-tailed aluminium-type comb, steel comb, which he shoved through the man's cheeks, both cheeks, tied in a knot. They rolled him up in a carpet and took him out. They weren't rough, really rough people. They were quite gentlemen, you know? It was only if you crossed their path the wrong way that you suffered. Upsetting the craze brought swift retribution. And Reggie had a big eight-inch hunting knife with a barbed dedge on it. And he stuck it through Mickey Morris's arm and obviously he screamed. And I said, pack it up because I said, you're going to have people run up the stairs. And Ronnie said, never mind about packing it up. He said, do it properly, Reg, do it properly. Put it up his guts, put it up his guts. Violence begot violence. They knew it paid off. So being twins, the craze, everybody feared them. That fear, generated by the craze love of violence, helped them build a powerful extortion racket in the East End. They had what I called their regular uh, pensions to collect. That was from, like, protection from clubs and 
gambling casinos and things like that. And then they had their fingers in a, in a lot of other pies, like, you know, where they'd demand a little bit here and a little bit there off of people who had done naughty things what they couldn't really go to the police about, so they'd get money that way. They would hear of the misdeeds of other young criminals in the East End, and they would want their pickings. They were known in the East End as thieves' ponces. That means that they steal off the thieves or take proceeds of their crimes. I reckon they were on, on an average, like in the 60s, which was a lot of money, about three or 4,000 quid a week. But the money wasn't ever going in a smash in a place up, it was already there. In actual fact, you went in, you had a cup of tea or a pint, you were made to feel quite at home. And any complaints, it was like, it was like uh, television repairmen coming. People were looking forward to you coming. Because if they had any problems, they'd tell you the problems, you'd take them back to the craze. And then the violent side of the craze, or, or the people who carried out the violent side for the craze, it would be passed on to them. The craze activities had now attracted the attention of the top echelons at Scotland Yard. Superintendent Leonard Nipper-Reed was one of the special team ordered to bring the twins' reign to an end. Nipper-Reed believed Sidney Vaughan was going to be one of his key witnesses. The police wanted convictions for wanted to use me to get the convictions. They wanted me to actually say that I was witness and there when the crowds had demanded Bonnie with menaces. Eventually it ended up in the Old Bailey. The evidence I gave to the court wasn't what the police wanted, so I was made an hostile witness. The case against the twins collapsed. Within hours, they contacted Sidney Vaughan. Brothers grateful, financial aid tonight. 5.45, Clerkenwell Tavern Pub, opposite Mount Pleasant Post Office. Tell no one. I received a telegram saying that money was being offered to me for my aid, etc., by the brothers. No money was ever forthcoming. Now believing they were untouchable, the craze moved into London's prosperous West End. But their business techniques lacked sophistication. I think the craze in their West End of London were a fish out of water. So they couldn't have the same kind of uh, code of silence, the same kind of code of loyalty. They couldn't put pressure on people who were already paying other gangsters, if you like, or other organisations. Seduced by glamour and glitz, the craze adopted a high profile, mixing with the rich and famous. Judy Garland, Barbara Windsor and Ronnie Fraser, and boxing legend Joe Louis, along with politicians and lords of the realm. Ronnie loved the glitter of showbiz uh, life. When Judy Garland was here, they took her to uh, one of the local pubs and they had a piano going and that in the pub. And Ronnie, she said to Ronnie, Judy Garland, I'll, I'll do a song. So Ronnie went over to this old girl and he said to her, do you know who that is over there, Annie? So she said, no, he said, it's Judy Garland. And she said to him, piss off. And he said, yeah, it's really Judy Garland. And she sang a couple of numbers in the pub. We were meeting or had clientele such as uh, Brian Epstein, Larry Parnes and these people. Uh, their way of life gave the Crays an opportunity, in particular Ronnie Cray, an opportunity to see a side where money could be made. This brought in the Mafia connections for the Beatles because the Mafia were very interested in that time of getting the Beatles into Las Vegas because they had all the other big people there. Every star's ended up in Las Vegas, but the Beatles never did. But uh, it never came off, although I think, uh, well, I know Brian Epstein paid Ronnie money. He never actually signed any parts of the Beatles over. In March 1965, the Crays were forced to temporarily abandon the bright lights of the West End and go into hiding when Ron killed a rival gang member, George Cornell. Believing Cornell had made insulting remarks about him, Ron walked into the blind beggar pub in the Mile End Road and shot him in the head. George had no respect for Ronnie or Reggie. Well, well, well. 
Mr. Cray. He used to say that when he was a big fat pup. He told May Morris, who was Mickey Morris's mother, that that Ronnie was after her son for like sexual activities. And Ronnie found out about, about this and he was very, very angry. And it was about a fortnight later that Ronnie shot George in the blind beggar. You haven't got the bottle. <laughs> Anyone who gave evidence against the Cray twins was very brave indeed. But I think one of the bravest women I've ever met was Patricia, a very gallant woman, uh, a barmaid in the Blind Beggar Public House in March of 66. I was talking to George. He was a regular customer. And all of a sudden he said, look who's here. And as I turned, Ronnie Cray came in with a, another fella. And as they came level, Ronnie and the other chap just suddenly had guns in their hand. Shot George and then turned towards me. And it's the only time I think I've seen Ronnie smile. And I thought, I think he's going to shoot me. And I realised that if I ran up the stairs, I could get shot in the back. So I just ran for the cellar and jumped the whole of the cellar stairs. And a shot was fired at Patricia, which whizzed past her ear into the wall behind her. It was probably an attempt to silence her forever. And I was scurrying around there like a frightened rabbit. I was trying to get behind barrels, crates, and realising there was just nowhere to hide. And I've never been so scared in all my life. And then it went very, very quiet. And I came up the stairs and um, Patsy, the governor of the pub, said to me, who is it? And I said, George Cornell. And I said to him, get me tea towels out of the steriliser. But I didn't realise how much of the back of his head was missing. All the blood was coming from the back and bits of brain. And I was trying to hold it together. What a brave woman after two years to come forward and give evidence of what she saw. Eighteen months after Ron Cray shot George Cornell, it was Ridge's turn to commit a high-profile murder. The Crays commandeered the flat of a local woman, Carol Green, forcing her to go to the home of her neighbour and best friend, Kitty Diamond. Later that evening, local villain, Jack the Hat McVitty, was lured to the flat in Evering Road on the pretext of a party. When Carol returned in the early hours with her boyfriend, she walked into a nightmare. Somebody came up the stairs and said to me, I'm sorry, Carol, you can't go downstairs. There's been a little bit of trouble and we're trying to clear the place up for you a bit. We don't want you to see it in such a mess. And there was a member of the firm walking up the lower basement stairs and he had a washing up bowl in his hand. And the washing up bowl was full with water, but you could see that the water was absolutely running in blood. I was made to go and wait in my bedroom. I could hear various noises outside. There was people up and down the stairs. And at one point, it sounded as if somebody was being dragged along somewhere. And also, I'm sure at some time I heard somebody say, have you got the hat or don't forget the hat? And that is when Jack the Hat immediately came into my brain because you always associated Jack with his hat. My boyfriend obviously was also sitting there listening to all this that was going on and he turned to me and he said, I'm telling you, they've topped someone. And I said, oh, oh, please don't say that. They wouldn't do that here, but they had. She was ashen and um, I said to her, what's the matter? And she was crying and hysterical and she said, I think they've killed Jack. When we went over, and we went down the stairs. I couldn't believe what I saw. I just saw blood everywhere. 
There was blood on the furniture on the couch. There was blood on the walls. The window was smashed. There literally was blood everywhere. It looked like a slaughterhouse. Reg stabbed Jack the Hat in the neck, severing his jugular vein. About six months after the murder, I was told that Reg would like to see me. And I went down there, and he was there with about four or five of his henchmen. And um, so called. And he said to me that um, he'd heard I was saying that they'd killed Jack the Hat. And I said, no, I hadn't. And he said, if we find out that you have, we will kill you and your three sons. And we won't think twice about it. In his books, he writes that I was a, a prosecution witness against him, even though he paid for my husband, Billy Collins's defense, which is an outright lie, not a mistake, a lie. The flourishing combination of lies, myths and rumours which followed the murders of Cornell and McVitie enhanced the Cray's reputation. People wanted to really know what the Cray's were about. Was it true that they were six foot six with deep voices? Uh, was it true that they were killers who had bodies under every motorway flyover in the UK? Was it true that they killed 20 or 30 or 40 or 50? How many bodies were around? Who knew? When we all talk about the number of people the Krays killed, they didn't necessarily go out and kill these people themselves, but they got others in to do the jobs for them. They had their own personal things, but they didn't go around smashing everybody up, only the people they didn't like personally. The others was just business to them. And uh, they'd send their lieutenants to do the violent side. How many did Ron actually kill? Maybe half a dozen. How many did Reg actually kill? maybe two or three, something like that. But how many did they have their members of the gang kill? It was a lot. All in all, they got rid of, I reckon, around 30 people. How they used to get rid of their bodies was they had a, a Polish fellow. He was, he was an elderly man over in South London, and they used to smell aluminium. And what he used to do, he, sometimes he, he used to have to hang on to the bodies for a little while until he could get rid of them. So he used to deep freeze them, so he got no smell, no blood, or anything like that about the place. Once the body was frozen up, he used to take the bodies out, saw the bodies up, and burn them, cremate them, like, but in pieces, in an aluminium smell. A number of the firm have talked about the incinerators. There's the graveyards. They'd get into the graveyard before a body was put in the hole. They'd put a body in the hole, put some earth on top, a new coffin would come in on top. They'd double up in the coffins at the funeral parlour. Then, of course, there was the Freddie Foreman trick of getting rid of the bodies at sea. That's what happened to Jack the Hat. He fed the crabs off the coast of Kent. No body, no crime. It was one of Ron's favourite expressions. Confident they were invincible, Ron, in 1968, decided to expand internationally and forge links with the American Mafia. That time when uh, Ron uh, went to America, to New York, to meet the Mafia, the families, um, I think he was very much under scrutiny by the police who had informers that they had slipped into him. People like Alan Cooper and Joe Kaufman, they were just informants, grasses if you like, as in provocateurs. And this Alan Cooper particularly, he was an American, a very short little fellow with a, with a lisp and a stutter, and his stutter became worse the longer he was in the twins' company. It got very pronounced. It took them to meet the Mafia. He might have met a couple of street hoods, a couple of, um, shall we say, crew members, but he never met any Mafia as such. All he met were actors, people who looked like Italian waiters, Zapata moustaches, big overcoats. Hiya, baby. How you doing? 
how you doing, man? He came back. He was over the moon. He really thought this is it, the big link up between him and his twin and the mafia. It's ludicrous. It's ludicrous. Whether ludicrous or not, Scotland Yard viewed the proposed alliance with alarm and launched a massive operation to end the craze rule. Finally, the wall of silence, which for so long had protected the craze, was pierced. In May 1968, the three brothers and eight other gang members were arrested and charged with murdering George Cornell and Jack McVitie and conspiracy to kill. After they were arrested, Ronnie wanted Albert Donoghue to say that he killed Jack the Hat, and he wanted Ronnie R to say that he killed George Cornell. And I said they'd take the rap for all the long firms and all the other little cases of violence. Ronnie liked obedience and he was very angry and annoyed when they wouldn't do it. Key witnesses were now prepared to stand up against the Cray gang. Three women were crucial prosecution witnesses. Kitty Diamond, Carol Green, and Patricia Kelly. After giving evidence, all three lived in fear for many years. Two were given new identities. After an eight-week trial, Ron and Reg were jailed for life. Charlie was sentenced to ten years. As they were driven away to start their sentences, many believed Britain's most dangerous organised crime empire had finally been smashed but they could not have been more wrong. They weren't organized. They were the most disorganized criminals prior to uh, 1969. Certainly, I've never heard of a new one. But since the incarceration, then it became a real organized enterprise. The Cray Empire started in April 1969. In episode two, how the Cray Empire flourished and grew behind bars. In March 1969, gang bosses Ron and Reg Cray started life sentences for murder. Many believed their notorious crime empire had been brought to an end. But the reality was to be very different. They were still wheeling and dealing from inside prison. It had just moved. The only problem was for the Crays that they had to get other people in to do those deals. You know, the network the people buying the Crays even though they were locked away, was, you know, it was still ongoing. There were still plenty of people who were out there willing to help them and willing to do, you know, things for them. He had his own phone, if you like, his, his own private phone, where if he wanted that phone, nobody else would use it until he used it. Now, he would use that phone and he would make probably 20 or 30 calls between six and bang up, which is about half seven. He's supposed to have about seven phone calls a week. But um, it all depends if... I mean, me and Reggie go through 40, 50 a day sometimes. A day. Conducting business over the phone was not the only way Reg issued instructions. After honing his fighting skills in the prison gym, Reg, who was a professional boxer in his youth, regularly summoned people to meetings. He would have seven or eight visitors at one time, but he's only allowed two. But he, he would farm out the others on other people's BOs, visiting orders. But they were all there ostensibly to see Reg, and they would do the rounds. When Reg is done with one visitor, and <coughs> they go on their way and they call you over. You get up off the table and go and sit down and you have your chat with Reg. And we go around like musical chairs. And sometimes visitors went maybe 200 miles to see Reg, and they had maybe three minutes of his time. And if they couldn't come up with what he wanted, they wouldn't get three minutes even, you know. This was, he was very, very, he was chairman of the board, really. It was a business meeting. It wasn't a visit. Reg wasn't in jail. Reg was in his boardroom. He hated Easter. He hated Christmas because he would have to take two or three days off from his business. Then he would ring, should we say, day after Boxing Day, say, thank God I can get back to business. So boring, these holidays, aren't they? It was quite Python-esque, but it happened. And Reg was 
very much money first, last round, in between. And he didn't care who got it for him or how they got it or as long as they got it. He always said, I am the one who makes the rules. I do the business. He was the boss of crime. Reg was issuing contracts on people to stab them, to shoot them, to do something to them, to make sure that they knew that they weren't supposed to do that again. That's the way Reg Cray was. So he was paying people to do things outside of jail. I had muscle for hire in my job. I, I, I had 500 doormen that were fighting two or three times a night on the door of a nightclub. And to go and give someone a good right-hander four or 500 quid, they were for hire. And he felt it very easy to then call that upon me. I then didn't want to do it. But like in, any, in anything at all, once you've done something once, it's really hard to not do it again. Anyone want to get, he, he wanted sorted out whilst I was around for him, I'd get it done. You know, just people use this word contracts, but like, we're not talking about contracts to kill, but you know, anyone needed livening up a little bit, it'd be me to get it, I'd either do it or sort it out for him. When Ron Cray was attacked by Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, in Broadmoor, Ron wanted to call you today. Ron said, look, it's over with, forget it. But Reg could not, he could not forget. Somebody had attacked his twin brother. It was Reg's reputation that was on the line. It wasn't Ron's. It had nothing to do with Ron. So Reg said, right, I'm going to get this guy. He found somebody who was going to be transferred to Broadmoor. He issued a contract on Sutcliffe. And this guy stabbed Sutcliffe in the eye. A court later ruled that the attacker, a friend of Reggie's, was mentally disturbed. Reggie never stopped intimidating people, in my view. When he got comfortable with me, after a year, he started asking me to intimidate people for his own gain, of which I did. The first thing Reg asked me to do was go around and evict someone that shouldn't have been in a house for another friend of his. Reg had told us to go there very early on a Sunday morning, knock on the door, give him the, the worst hiding he had ever had, which we did. We went there, knocked on the door. As soon as he comes out, like, I smashed him as hard as I could in the face, and I broke my hand. Looked at me hand, my hand's collapsed, and now the guy that's with me, he's, uh, he's got a snap-on ratchet with him, and he put this all about his face, like, like nobody's business. This guy was totally unconscious, jumping up and down on his face. Get in the car, like, we bugger off. Get down to the prison, we tell Reg, right, it's sorted. He didn't have two words to say, well done, that was it. Right now, I'm thinking this bloke's dead. His nose was on one side of the floor and his teeth were on the other side of the fence. And he didn't, he didn't even know his own name. And uh, Reg didn't give a monkey to tell the truth. And as far as he was concerned, he was doing a favour for a little boy in a prison that was doing him favours. One of my sons encountered um, Reg Cray in uh, Parkhurst Prison. And my son had not gone in the name of Collins, which is the name that uh, Reg should have known him by. He'd gone in in his surname uh, of my second husband. But that didn't stop Reg going and saying to him, your mother gave evidence against me at the Old Bailey. And somebody ran past him and sliced his face open with a razor. Reg Cray was what I would call a, a manipulator of, of people. Um, he was um, a guy who usually got what he wanted, one way or another. He had a lot of influences in, in, uh, in the prison and on the outside. And, and many times Reg asked people and myself to follow prison officers and just let him know where they lived, what type of background these prison officers had, whether they had a family, children, so on. And, and then he would use that as intimidation for uh, prison officers when he was on a visit to uh, turn a blind eye to any packages or any money or any, anything that shouldn't have been ha been happening. Could you please go and see someone and make sure that he doesn't call me a, a dirty, stinking killer? Because it's not true, I'm not a dirty, stinking killer. I may have been a killer, but I wasn't a dirty, stinking type. Could you please go and see him or ask someone, maybe you saw a name at me, uh, to make sure that he doesn't say it again, please? Nicely, of course. And this happened.
I was owed uh, uh, money at one point by an agent whose name we won't mention, but I think he knows who he is. Uh, owed me a, quite a considerable amount of money. And for months, for months, I'd be saying, well, you owe me money. He said, oh, Richie, you'll get it when I've got it, blah, blah, blah. And in the two days after I'd been to visit Reg, it had been in the papers that uh, I'd been to visit him at Maidstone, and the following day I got a cheque from this agent. And to this day, I can only put it down to the fact that he went, Oh, you took Shane Reggie, go for it, I'll get him the money. <laughs> After four or five years waiting for Reg, I could have had any man taken off the street at a click of my fingers. And I felt more powerful than I ever felt in my life. And it was, it was unbelievable. It was, it was, it was a feeling of, I felt untouchable. I was touchable, I was very touchable. But you don't see that. To succeed at something like the twins have succeeded at, on the scale that they have succeeded, you can't do it without a hint of violence, a hint of menace. And believe you me, the twins were the original merchants of menace. In 1980, Ron and Reg Cray were separated. Ron's mental stability had deteriorated. He was declared insane and sent to Broadmoor. He was still organising things from inside Broadmoor. And the things that he used to wear and the people that things used to send me in with, I'd go and pick up three pure white silk shirts, beautiful Italian silk shirts, and take them into him. And he had a tailor called Barry Scott come from Wembley, go into Broadmoor, stand him up, measure him up every six months for a silk Italian style suit. Crocodile shoes, £300 a pair. He had access to lots and lots of dough. He had his bank accounts, his building society accounts. He was a little more, surprisingly, a little more shrewd than Reg in that respect. I remember being called out one day to Broadmoor by the canteen man. I was with Charlie Cray at the time. We'd had a wonderful visit. He was never in a good mood with Charlie Cray, Ronnie. He'd tell him off and have a go at him at the table. But this particular afternoon, it was good. As we left, the canteen man came out and said, Charlie, can I talk to you for a moment? Say, well, what's the matter? It's about Ronnie's bill. Well, how can you have a bill? He used to drink four non-alcoholic lagers, which was, of course, all you were allowed in there. Barbican, their name was. I'd have maybe two teas or two coffees. Charlie Cray would have two teas and two coffees. Well, his canteen bill is 900 pounds. Now, we used to have the visits in a hall, and next to the hall was a shop. Now, I'm talking about a shop, not a, uh, a little shop, something like Marks and Spencer's. In that shop was clothes, lighters, cigarettes, sweets, chocolate, no drink, no alcohol, nothing like that, uh, trainers. It, it was a, and a guy who run the shop, funny enough, his name was Reg. Ronnie was always in the shop buying lighters and get them engraved and send them to people. Um, christening mugs, he, you know, uh, he heard someone had a baby, he'd go in there and say, Reg, would you uh, send a christening mug and engrave it and put it on my account? One day, i have just come off a visit seeing Ron, and the guy who owned the shop, little Reg, called me, he said, Jackie, he said, can I ever talk to you? I said, certainly, Reg, what's about? He said, would you like to come in my office, you know? So, went in his office, sat down, he said, um, I'm a bit concerned, Jack. I said, well, what's, what's, what's the matter, Reg? He went, he said, Ronnie's run a bill up at £7,000. I said, well, don't worry. He's going to get half a million pounds shortly for, for, for the movie. He'd be paid. He went, oh, all right, Jack. And he, you know, and going out the door, I said, oh, by the way, is he all right for his more credit? He went, don't worry. He can have as much as he wants. He was known in Broadmoor as the watchman. He used to ask his visitors, please, could you bring me in a watch? And he didn't mean a penny ante watch, he meant an expensive watch. And then I'd go with the guy and he'd sit down. Ronnie Cray, this is Joe, but he'd like to meet you, shake hands. The eyes used to light up like a kid in the factory of sweets. Oh, I like that watch. Um, could you get me one like that? To which you see any, any guy looking at Ronnie Cray, sitting there going to be there for 30 years with no um, hope of being free, would go, oh, hell. You can have it. If you wore anything and then he liked it, you had to give him it. That was it. And when you think about it, doing 30 years, keep him happy we used to do it, you know. Because let's face it, he was doing 30 years, we went. So we get, you know, and I had this beautiful coat on. He looked down, he went, oh, Jack, he said, what a beautiful overcoat. And I knew he wanted it. I went, Ronnie, 
I'll leave the coat at reception for you, you know. Reg Cray visited his brother every six months. The transport would be laid on. He'd have two or three or maybe four heavy guards going with him for the ride. Wherever Reg was, around the country, Parkhurst or whatever, he would have this six monthly visit to see his brother, where they could sit down quietly and discuss all their personal business. Released from prison in 1975, elder brother Charlie was fronting the family firm. When Charlie came out of jail, after being inside for seven years, one of his first contacts was with the mob in New York. These people had certain ideas of how Charlie could get back into business. One of them, of course, was setting up a record company. The initial idea of Attack Music Corporation was to launder money. The original two million was to come in, help to set up the company, run it as a legitimate company. But the idea was, because most of the artists came from America, and money would be coming backwards and forwards from America, this was an obvious laundering setup. And when I found out exactly what was going on, I was originally a part of that company. I pulled out. I got up one day and I said, this has gone far enough. <laughs> and I walked. Attack Music Corporation went out of existence in the late 1980s. I had sawn off shotguns stuck under my nose and told, you be quiet about this or else. I've been threatened people telling me that they'll pick my children up from school. And when Charlie Cray tells me on the phone he'll take care of me, even if he has to spend the rest of his life in jail, this is serious business. Although protecting their money laundering scams was paramount, Reg was constantly looking for new ways of generating cash. Fellow prisoner Bradley Allardyce, who during his 10 years inside became so close to Reg that Reg referred to Bradley as his adopted son, remembers one very lucrative prison visit. You know, I mean, for instance, two people from Blackpool come down to see me and Reg on a visit and said um, they owned hotels and they just sold up all their hotels and asked Reg if they could open a club in Blackpool called The Craze. And Reg said yes, and they give him £30,000. Six months later, we didn't hear nothing for six months. Six months later, they've got in touch again and said, Reg, we decided against doing that club. Did, um, didn't even mention the money. Didn't even ask for the money back. Every week, I would say that Reg can have a new business idea. Some of them were workers and some of them wasn't, but he'd insist on putting equal amount of effort into each project. He earned a shilling and spent one in six all his life, so did his brother Ron. And I really do think, taking it to extremes, that if Reg had earned ten million pounds in the years he was in prison, he would have spent ten and a half million pounds. Because ostensibly it wasn't his money. He didn't really care. He was enjoying it. Had all he wanted and his friends had all they wanted. It meant um, freedom. No one telling me what to do. I could tell people what to do. It meant um, having money, even though I weren't spending it. It meant um, walking down the street and people saying, works for the twins, that boy. Reg sent a limousine for me. Now, this, this car was meant to have been President Eisenhower's presidential Cadillac of 1956. They come and open the car to me like I'm a king. I'm, I'm at the bar now and champagne's being thrown at me. Now, what does that tell you? What the name of the Cray can do for you? And you have this huge, huge ego that was being fed incessantly by his army of groupies, camp followers, and admirers. Reggie's biggest financial um, coup was a lottery winner, Carl Crompton. He won 11 million pounds on the lottery. He gave Reggie 100,000 pounds. Reg asked him if he could borrow it to set up a few business deals and this and that, and Carl said, yeah, it would be a pleasure. And um, Reg um, asked Carl if he could make out the cheques for £33,000 each, and Reg got back to the cell and got out a piece of paper from his drawer, sat down and spent that £100,000 in about 15 minutes, writing down a list of people to give it to, debts to pay as well. You know, about a week later, he was up saying, right, come on, we've got to get a few quid. Um, I've said, like, Reg had grand last week. 
one day I went to see Ronnie on a visit. And I come out with this idea to him. I said, Ronnie, I said, look, I said, we've got the best name in the business. I said, why don't we do a personal bodyguard service for film stars and Arab noblemen? So he said, yeah, because he, he always agreed with me, Ronnie. He said, Jack, it's a well, wonderful idea because he was an order of show business and that type of thing, you know. So I thought of this thing called Crayley Enterprises. And what it was is we look after Arab Normal and Hollywood stars. We went in slightly un underfunded, but we got over that problem. I come up with this idea. We'll advertise in the melody for bodyguards. Now, we didn't want these people. So I, we advertised in the melody to send a £2 registration fee to join Crayley Enterprises as a bodyguard. And, you know, it was unbelievable. Within two weeks, we had over £17,000 in post loaders. They're a good crew, and we've done everything right everywhere. We had accountants, we had a banking account, which I won't get down the side of it. And it was, it, it, was, it was lovely. It was a racist business. The police come to see us. They said, yeah, carry your by all means. We're looking after the Arabs and the film stars. Best thing since sliced bread. They just couldn't stop making money and spending or giving it away. The growing fascination with the Cray cult also attracted a string of celebrities to visit them in prison. One in the early 80s was former pop star Roger Daltrey. Roger Daltrey wanted to do the film and in the end of the day he bought the rights. He sat on them for five years and didn't make the film in the end, um, sold them on again. The rights were sold to Parkfield Group PLC. The contract says very, very clearly Charlie Cray was to get 100,000, Reg Cray 100,000, Ron Cray 100,000 pounds. Charlie would also get money, quite a substantial sum, as technical advisor. Another set of twins, the Kemps, were picked to play Ron and Reg in the movie depicting their life of violence in the East End. You're in trouble, Jack! Before filming started, the Kemps went to visit Ron in Broadmoor. And when they walked in, they'd on purposely worn overcoats, shirts, ties, and slicked back their hair. Even the wardens on the door, they just couldn't believe it. They, they, they said, these are the two guys that are going to play the twins. And I went, yeah. And we sat down and I said, look, I'll just say hello, blah, blah, blah. Then I'll go and sit with Charlie Smith so you can talk some business. And in case Ronnie wanted to tell them little, they wanted to pick up little things that he did. You know, especially with the hand movements and the quietness of the voice. Because I think everybody you talk to thinks that because they were feared so much, they shouted and screamed, whatever. Well, if the guy is menacing enough, you never have to raise your voice because Ronnie Cray could just look at you with one look. And what he wanted done was done. And he looked at those two and he just said, Who's playing me? And Martin Kemp smiled. And the minute that Martin Kemp smiled, you're the soft one. You can play Reggie. <laughs> and he looked at Kerry Kim and he went, you're playing me. What'd you say? Me? Nothing. Yes, you did. You called me something. What'd you call me? During negotiations for the film rights, the Cray's biggest underworld rival in the 60s, torture gang boss Charlie Richardson, tried to muscle in on the deal. Richardson sent his associate, Eddie Jones, to see Ron. In 1984, Charles Richardson was released from his 25-year sentence, for which he served 19 years. He said to me in his office one day in, in New Cross, why did you pop down to Broadmoor to see the Mad Hatter? I understand that Roger Daltrey's blanked them and more dough for their film. See if we can walk in on it. To help persuade Ron, Eddie Jones took fellow gang member Mad Frank Fraser and the actor Stephen Burkoff, who was to play George Cornell, on the visit. So one spring morn, Frank Fraser, uh, Stephen Burkoff, and myself popped down to Broadmoor. Stephen Burkoff was absolutely rigid with fear, I think, at this time. First question Ron said to me was, well, why doesn't Charlie come to see me? Charlie Richardson. Well, I said, it's very difficult, Ron, I said, for him to come and see you, isn't it? You know, you shot George Cornell, Frank, you know, who worked for Charlie. He was a good friend of Charlie's. Olive, George Cornell's wife, is still around in Peckham. What's he going to tell her if he bumps into her? 
Oh, I went down to see Ron last week. Ron Cray. I mean, you can't do it, can you? Let's be honest. To which Ron Cray replied, Well, it's nothing personal, you see, in those days. What you've got to realise is, I taught George Kinnock, but it wasn't personal. And Frank Fraser gave a classic reply to that. He said, well, in my, in my book, Ron, he said, shooting a man in the head and killing him, he said, and blowing his brains over the bar of a pub is the most personal thing you can ever do to anyone. It's the most personal thing I've ever heard of. The success of the film glamorized the Cray's violent exploits, creating a wave of hero worship amongst a younger generation. In episode three, how the Cray movie created a new money-making era, and they cashed in big time. Jailed for life in 1969 for murder, Ron and Reg Cray spent their time behind bars financing a lifestyle of luxury and favor. By the mid-1980s, the world outside had changed, and many of their original money-making activities began to dwindle. The film The Craze brought them cult status and new money-making opportunities. One of their most successful scams was celebrity parties billed as charity events. It was an attempt to give the three Cray brothers a Robin Hood image as they extracted money from hero-worshipping groupies. You get your tickets printed and you've got a long list of, I call them plastic gangsters. These are people that are fanatics with, with the craze and believe me, there's a lot of them. Once you've sent all the invitations out to, to them type of people, you've got to now uh, get some media coverage and decide who's coming to the party. Um, meaning famous people. Now, to do this, what we did, we'd go to the prison and say, right, Reg, who can we get there today? He'd turn around and say, right, Shane Ritchie's come to visit me a couple of weeks ago, there's his number, give him a bell. So you'd ring up Shane Ritchie, bingo, he turns up, take a nice little video shot of him doing a little auction for Reggie Cray, and uh, all these people are mad on Shane Ritchie, you know. Some of the parties I attended, uh, some of the charity events, I met some fabulous people some great characters. There was one pub in particular I went to. Everybody had a crazy story to tell. And it reminded me, because I'd just done a documentary about Elvis at Graceland. And I attended a similar party in Graceland where they were talking about Elvis. And they were talking about Reggie and Ronnie exactly the same way. I go, oh, I remember when Reggie did the... Oh, he was lovely, yeah. Celebrities meant nothing to these people, to the twins. I mean, they didn't realise that these guys normally worked for a fee. People like John Altman, uh, Nasty Nick of EastEnders, people like Nigel Benn, people uh, like Ross Kemp of EastEnders. Uh, they were divorced from reality there. They, they were living in a, in, a, in a bubble. They thought these people would just do as they asked. And, surprisingly, they did. They turn up for nothing. I think they must get a buzz out of being around these type of people. But the ones that would want paying are the... Uh, infamous gangsters from the 60s that run with Reg in the East End um, that are still around today. They wouldn't, even Reggie's brother Charlie, uh, he wouldn't turn up at one of these parties unless he was getting his palm light sorted with a bit of cash, you know? And sometimes I used to laugh at them, like, want to cut 100 pound out to turn up. Like, we'll take it up with Reg. Well, Reg knows this. And if you don't have Charlie Cray there, now the fans ain't gonna buy the tickets. They want to see a Cray. So the craze turn up, you get the fans. You get the fans, you get the money. So you've got to pay uh, Charlie. If Charlie turns up, you've got the money from the tickets. Charlie was never one to turn his nose up with a, a free drink or a five pound note or a ten pound note. He dined out, obviously, and why not? Many, many, many times over the years. Charlie was a lovely man. He always had a smile, always had a glass of scotch, always told you what you wanted to hear about the twins. I took the crumbs off the table. And let me say this, not an insubstantial amount of crumbs. He really lived a life. He was a nice man. But the twins were making serious money at this time. Very serious money. Reg was um, always on the ball. He, he wanted the money as soon as he could get it. That was either send it to him in recorded delivery envelopes, special delivery next day, say he got it the next day, or 
he'd ask you to take the money direct yourself to the prison, which could be quite a lot of money, like a thousand, two thousand pounds, and you take it in and he would never directly take the money off you, he'd have another prisoner there um, on another table and you would give that prisoner the money and they'd, they'd conceal it uh, and take it, take it back with them. And when they got back to the cells at the end of the visit, they'd obviously pass it on to Reg. I did many charities for Reg and I was never aware even to this day that money was siphoned off and went directly to Reggie. I mean, I've done charities in the past before for obviously other people other than Reggie and where money's gone missing. And I think if there was ever any rumours that that happened, I, I, I don't know if Reggie would be responsible. I think people on the outside took advantage of the whole Cray uh, phenomenon. But so I, I had that experience of happening with Reggie. One party I did, at the end of the night, it was, oh, I don't know, 12 o'clock, divvying up the money. And someone says to me, like, how much money you made out of this girl? And there was three grand on the table. I said, nothing. Because I knew the next morning, Reg would be on the phone, and that money was going to get sent everywhere. And do you know what? Sometimes I had even had to pay for the uh, special delivery. The press said, Reggie's raised so much money for charity. Reggie's paid this to charity. Reggie's given this to charity. No money was going anywhere other than his pocket. A small percent, he, he, he declare as this is going into the... Um, the the fund, as he called it. There was a young boy, uh, I can't remember his name, from Nottingham, and he suffered from muscular dystrophy. And I think, generally, they did send him to Florida, but that's before I knew Reg. I did a party in Newcastle, which raised £2,100 for Terry Moran, uh, the Burns boy. Um, and as a result of that, Reg asked us to do a second party, basically to raise money for himself. But this was obviously something which I'd, I'd strongly disagreed with. Ronnie and Reggie Cray said to me, well, look, you can go along there and do a raffle for your charity, but we want some money. We're broke in here, and Ronnie Cray spent money in wa wa like water in Broadmoor, buying people presents, sending money out to people, unbelievable things he used to buy in there. And I said, well, look, I'll go along and do the charity. At the moment, EastEnders was the big thing on television, and Leslie Grayson was Dirty Den. And I phoned him up and said, would you like to come along and help me? And he came along, and he bought me some big cuddly toys for the raffle. And um, at the end of the night, I said to Ron, uh, Georgie Dixon and Alan Dixon, well, what are you going to give Ronnie and Reggie? And they said, they can have the money that we took on the door. Well, that's okay by me. All I knew, I had my little envelope with £1,500 in it, and that was going to Harefield Hospital. What they took on the door, what they took from tickets, I don't know, I don't care. But they had to have their money. Uh, you've got to remember these tickets that we're sending out are like £25, £30 a throw. The money that we earn on charity events, well, we call them charity events, but that was just a cover. Um, or money that came in from drugs or, or wherever the money came from that we got uh, w would be sent to Ron. Um, and Reg, mainly Reg, uh, Reg would say, send, send, uh, send Ronnie 200 quid. Ronnie would send that straight out to one of his, uh, his boys, as he called them, his little boys. And R R Reg would um, pay, pay his, his male friends, his young male friends in, in Maidstone and for sexual favours. He kept it in the, himself in the closet in them days. I was there a little while before he came out sideways if you like, as I call it, come out sideways, approach me for sex, and as much as that, I was cutting his hair, and I stand in with me, I was standing in his shorts and everything, and I was cutting his hair, and he then stroked the back of my leg with his hand. But to his surprise, I, I grabbed the scissors and I went, I went for him. More than once, Reg was given an official warning by the prison authorities to stay away from young offenders. At one point, he became so concerned about his own sexual activities, that he underwent an AIDS test. It proved negative. His, let's call it, gay activities were something that he wanted to keep quiet. One way of keeping those activities quiet was to give presents, favours, a gold watch, a um, new suit, and that kind of thing through the years cost Reg Cray a lot of money. And again, Reg always needed a source of money to pay people off. He told me that 
he's had um, a relationship with a boy and this this young boy is threatening to tell the whole story to news of the world for a substantial amount of money and that i must stop this happening so he wants me to travel all the way to ramby prison and under duress make this kid sign an affidavit and it listed a, a number of things um, and it said underneath it if any of the above has been given to any national newspaper all the above was only for uh, financial gain to myself and all of it is untrue he says well get out of the prison and uh, sort this kid out this kid comes out sits down like right drippy little looking kid he should have uh, been dealt with like a lot of other people Reg dealt with but you see Reg had a soft spot really. and I had to sit there and tell this kid if any of this got into the national press it'd get really hurt now when I say really hurt I mean really hurt and this this kid uh, understood what we was telling him in in that prison that day it's all off the chap is not going to go through with it neither ever will he it will not come up again. You will not hear another thing of or about the nonce from Knots. He's been taken care of. Reg was over the moon. Great, he can't do nothing now. And if he does, I've got this now. And if there, anything comes out in the papers, I can react to it. He was very much a closet homosexual. Uh, whereas Ron was a little more blatant. Um, he confessed to being bisexual, I think, at the age of 19. Shocked his family, rigid, I'm told. Well, he had a great attraction um, towards young men, Ronnie, um, but they had to be extremely young and extremely handsome. And he had, um, he had a several in Broadmoor. One, I had to go to Denmark Street, which, as you know, is called the Music Street, with £150 in an envelope, and I had to buy a guitar. And I thought, well, what have I got a guitar for, Ronnie? And he used to say, it's for Charlie. Charlie in here, he's my friend, and winked to me, and I said, where is he? And he said, three tables over there, and I'd look, and I'd see this handsome, beautiful young boy. He said he's learning to play the guitar, and I was surprising for Christmas. Um, he was sitting with his mother, this kid. Um, his name's Charlie Smith, and you see, I presumed that that was a lover, or a would-be lover, at the time. So long I go to Denmark Street and buy this beautiful guitar, which was a lot of money, you know, 20 years ago, um, £150 for a guitar, and they'd um, have to parcel it all up and send it to Broadmoor. I wonder what they thought in the end, you know, to Ronnie Cray, care of Broadmoor and a beautiful guitar. But um, I'd be sent out to buy excellent, uh, unbelievable stuff, you know, cashmere sweaters at Christmas for this Charlie Smith, beautiful watch, underwear, or oh, had to have Calvin Klein underwear. Reggie's demands were entirely different. Alcohol was top of his list. Every master brewing, the jails I was in with him, they all had a special brew down for Reg. Good customer. Always paid cash. Prison booze is dangerous. It's made with some very dodgy ingredients, but it is powerful stuff. He used to carry it by the gallon, you know, a great big bucket full. Pass the screws and they go, hello Reg, and look the other way, they, you know. Let him get away with blue murders he did. If it wasn't made in jail like prison hooch, the screws bought the drinking for us. Paid handsomely for it as well they were. I mean for a ten pound bottle of scotch we'll have to give a screw thirty quid. Reg had a, every, a screw in every nick that would, you know, that was available to do things for him. If me and Reg got a bottle of scotch from a screw, we'd go behind their door and we'd wedge the door up so no one can come in. The relaxing of prison regulations under a new liberalisation policy in the 80s enables drink, drugs and phone cards to be smuggled in on a regular basis to buy favours for Reg and his close friends. It was quite funny to go on a visit to Reg because a lot of the time the people who I went with would take in um, alcohol for Reg. Uh, you know, a medicine bottle probably with scotch concealed somewhere on that person. Um, and, you know, the, the added bonus that the prison officers at Nottingham Prison tended not to check um, anybody, you know, very well meant that Reg could, you know, basically get a, a good drink inside him. So the, the visits to Nottingham, Reg was usually, you know, three sheets to the wind by the time I left him. The prison officers in uh, Maidstone Prison used to give him an helping hand back to the, um, back to the uh, cells there. 
he had so many visitors, so many mules and carriers, that I know that large amounts of booze were smuggled in, yes. Square spirits, of course, and um, other substances, you know. He used to do ecstasy and cocaine in Maystone. I remember I was over cutting his hair one day over in, in Maystone, because I was in Park, I was only Maystone, with him. two separate sentences I did. And uh, he had a bag of Charlie's, it's called, slang name for cocaine, and it was, it was like a bag of sugar, you know. So I thought it was to start with, until he told Bradley to give me a couple of lines, and then they was running around on ecstasy pills, you know, but, you know, he had 30 years. He had to break it up as best way as he could. I know he called me many times between 6 and 6.30, and he'd usually had a drink by then. Hooch, of course. And he was normally quite, quite slurring with his speech, and he would get a little more aggressive in his tone on the telephone than he normally would. And this is his business hour, I think, between six and seven, where he would bark out his orders, if people could understand him, and if he was, if you like, nasty in his tone or, or threatening, that was the time that uh, it would come out. You know, there was no limits on his screaming and shouting, whether you was a day late with his letter, whether you didn't drop off a load of money or collect some money from someone like you should have done, or whether you went round and had a word with a geezer like he told you to, or didn't do it, it's the, the shouting from him was all the same, it's all straight up to volume 10. Yeah. Would you do this, please? Effing please, do you effing mind, kind of thing? And then he would calm down and say, right, thank you very much, I've got to go, I'm going to a party now, in someone's cell. I mean, he enjoyed it, you know, it was his party. Ron Cray died in 1995, and the underworld turned out to pay its respects. His funeral was said to be the biggest London had seen since the death of Sir Winston Churchill. Security was paramount. Reg arranged every detail, going to extraordinary lengths for the brother he called his other half. But Reg had an ulterior motive. I just remember the, you know, the, the I guess saying, you know, he's ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and the coffin getting lowered in, and then the bizarre sight of people who I knew had respect for the family and respect for their twins taking photographs, and somebody with a video recorder, and I was thinking just how bizarre is this, you know? This is a funeral, this is where you're paying your respect to somebody who you're supposed to have feelings for, or you're supposed to feel close for, and you're standing with a video camera videoing it in. It wasn't until later on that I realised that it was all part of Reg, and Reg is let me make some money out of my brother's death by doing a, f a video. Reg's hopes of making money out of another big occasion, his wedding to Roberta Jones in July 1997, were dashed when prison authority was an attempt to impress the parole board. I, on his behalf, trademarked the name the Cray Twins, and whether or not a court would have uh, agreed with uh, an action that may have been brought for breach of copyright, I don't know, but at least he had control. And if he saw his name uh, being used either in a book or uh, on a piece of merchandise, etc., that he didn't know about, that he hadn't sanctioned, then he would go ballistic. The merchandising really generated hundreds of thousands of pounds. They sold everything from photographs to cufflinks, to scarves, to t-shirts, to big placards. They sold anything they could do with a double R on it. They would have belt buckles made with a double R on it. They would have pins you could put in your lapel with a double R on it. Calendars, picture discs, tea towels. We done prints of, uh, of, of a painting that by Paul Lake. I'll pay Paul like a thousand pounds out of my own money to get that done. Then I'll pay to have the prints made up. And we sold them on sign. We got the twins to sit in their cells and sign up these sticky label things. And we stick them either side, one from Ron, one from Reg on it. We charge, I think it was 195 pounds for them. Anything they could make money on. And there are a lot of people out there who not only were willing to make it and make it at a reasonable price, there were a lot of people who wanted to pay for it. And there are still people today buying Cray merchandise and memorabilia, even on the, the internet. 
I just keep picking bits up off the internet and keep buying it and draining my pockets. I'd imagine I've spent now in the region of four, four, five and a half thousand pounds. Now that the three brothers are dead, it's going to increase in value even more. I bought this picture. Um, it's signed by Reg. The actual original one of this was on the internet. They auctioned it off and that fetched in the region of £750. And then they came up with the idea that they'd do these laminated copies and these were going for like £10-£15 each. The t-shirts originally were about £15.99 but they're fetching £25 now for some of them. Some of the original ones like this, this one were a rough justice. I mean you could probably get £30-£35 no trouble, probably even more. I would say that the careers made more money inside prison than they did outside as, as criminals. Um, a turnover, you know, I could never estimate what it was, but I'm, I'm sure it was, you know, millions. There was 15 main people working for the twins, uh, pulling money in, and I think most of them were pulling in probably more than I did. I must have earned that man 70 grand, 70,000 pounds. I would certainly say that I made possibly 100,000 for them in different deals. Um, you know, but the money very rarely touched my fingers and, you know, was always, you know, into the careers, back pockets. When he realised that he had stomach problems, that was around about 1996, 97, he knew then that possibly his days were numbered. Instead of just sitting back and taking it easy, Reg Cray started issuing more contracts, doing more deals. Reg Cray was even doing business on his deathbed. It was a huge amount of money, 200,000 plus, for his last confession. A nice little earner for a killer. In that confession, Reg admitted one more killing, but despite the huge payment, he failed to name his victim. Peter Gillette believes he knows the victim's identity. He didn't elaborate on the program, but uh, 16 years ago, Reg burdened me with the secret of this other murder he did. It wasn't a villain, it wasn't a policeman, it was a young boy, a young gay boy. It was before um, they went away, obviously they was, well, they were still living in Vanance Road, I believe. This boy had got into bed with him, give him um, a blowjob or whatever you want to call it, give him head, and he didn't, found it, he enjoyed it. I think it was his disgusting himself at realising that he had, he, he enjoyed that sort of thing and it showed him he was gay or bisexual, well, he shot the kid. After 32 years and four months behind bars, Reg Cray died on October the 1st, 2000. Five weeks after being released by the Home Secretary on compassionate grounds. He's buried with his brothers in Chingford Cemetery. I think even now, the three are gone to the great criminal empire in the sky. I think the bandwagon will continue to roll and roll and roll. It will expand, it will gain speed, people will come, they will feed off it and into it, and it will always, I think, remain a money spinner for all concerned. Long live the craze. The craze is dead. Long live the craze.